Hi, I'm Sarah. And I'm Megan. We're two moms with eight kids between us, from little to grown. We're in different areas of the country and in different stages of life. But we both know that motherhood's a lot easier when real moms share tips and encouragement. And remind you that it's really all going to be okay. We're not experts. We're parents who've been there. We're not perfect. We're real. Welcome to the Mom Hour. Hey, everyone, and welcome to episode 342 of the Mom Hour. I am Sarah Powers here with Megan Francis. Hey, Megan. Hi, Sarah. So we're talking about fun today or not. Lack thereof. <laughs> Lack thereof. I mean, I hope this is someone's first time listening. If so, please settle in. But let me educate you for a bit. So we have a bit of a reputation on this show, an early reputation for openly hating fun. And that fun is in air quotes. We had a very early episode in 2015 where you talked about how you hated pushing kids on the swings and we both talked about hating parades and I don't know. We just um, for an hour, we talked about these things that are supposedly fun with our kids that we do not enjoy and that either repelled or attracted a lot of listeners. Probably to, both. Into <laughs> it our was a community. polarizing situation. Yes. I mean, to the point that just last week, Megan, you posted about taking your older kids, your teens to a water park and you had a lovely little essay on Instagram. But someone was like, this is not very fun hater of you to go yes, to a water I park. I saw that and then I felt like kind of like, do I need to defend myself because I went to a water park with my kids? Now, the funny thing is, even in the time that we recorded that episode, I would not have ranked going to a water park as the kind of fun I didn't enjoy because I did enjoy it. So it just Mm -hmm. shows you that like it, you know, your miles may vary when it comes to what in your life is in the category of this ain't fun. And it's supposed to be, um, in my life, taking the kids to the water park was always at least moderately fun Mm -hmm. and now has become a lot more fun in some ways because I don't have to do all those things that I used to have to do. Like watch them. There's no swim diapers involved. (laughs) There's no swim diapers involved. And there's no like, you know, there's no me sitting literally in tepid water up to my waist. You know what I mean? Like you Mm kind of sit in that shallow end. You're just like sitting there with a baby crawling around in the water. I mean, that was my life for a really long time. I still found it reasonably fun. Like there's like a, there's a grand spectrum and then there's things that are really not fun and there's things that are okay fun. Like they're good enough. The, the ends justify the means. Well, and it's so individual, as you said, and and I'm glad you brought that up because let's be clear, like part of talking about what's supposed to be fun and what isn't fun for us is I think it actually gives other moms permission to have actual opinions about the ways in which they make memories with their kids. And that is, I know we're laughing a lot, but that's like fundamentally important. If you as a mom feel like everybody loves library story time and you hate it, but you can't say that out loud. That's a bummer. I think we all get yeah. to have opinions about what's fun and what's not fun. And and the other thing is I think it opens up the conversation about how do we have fun with our kids? Okay, great. So like for you, the water park was not a no-go. That was on the list of things that like, okay, it might be a hassle. It might be hard work, but I can have fun at a water park. And for someone else, that might be like a never fun situation. You know, that also reminds me of things that when like how personality driven this is and how it's not the category of fun necessarily that eliminates it as a fun option for you, um, but can be like the specific way that it plays out. So uh, an example that you just mentioned was library story time. I remember actually our library story time when I had like three young kids. I think Will was five. Owen was three, and Clara was a newborn or maybe I was still pregnant with Clara when we used to go and after story time, there was a craft and I wanted to stab my eyeballs out a couple of reasons. (laughs) First of all, you had, so the parents, each parent got like a role, like a job to help. And so you would walk around with say the bag of cotton balls and you would dispense three, no more than three (laughs) cotton balls onto each child's craft area. And then, you know, somebody else would give a dab of glue. So it was like, it was, to me, the most stifling and pointless kind of crafting that there is. It's literally just kids gluing these three cotton balls they've been given onto the spot where an adult put a piece of glue. Like it just, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. what is the point? Why are we even doing this? Now, I was never the parent who hated letting my kids do crafts in my kitchen because I don't care about mess that much. So you know what I mean? Like some parents would be like, oh my gosh, I have to get all this stuff out and they're going to wreck my kitchen. And I was like, destroy the kitchen. I don't care. It buys me some time to do something I like. I'll deal with it later. Right. Very different reason why craft, like an organized craft time in a group made me really 
feel very, I don't know, like yes. I was crawling out of my skin. And while, do, while doing it at my house felt totally different. And right. that's partly personality. That's partly where you're at, like what stage you're in with your kids. There's, there's so much to it. There is. And that's where uh, a good time to bring in the quote that gets thrown around a lot from Amy Poehler, which is good for her, not for me or good for them, not for me. So like our giant disclaimer in this episode is like the whole point is not that the fun that we hate should be the fun that you hate. It's actually the opposite. Like, isn't it amazing that we live in a world where some moms love to craft with their kids and some moms hate it and there's room for all of us. So we're not hating on your favorite activities with kids. We're actually giving you permission to hate something maybe that we love. So um, this is going to be fun. We are going to talk about some things that are quote unquote supposed to be fun with kids that we think are not. And then we'll talk about like whether those things are kind of never ever fun or maybe like you said, it's situation dependent. We have a couple of ideas that came through from our contributor team and some familiar, some familiar categories of fun <laughs> that I don't think we'll ever change our minds about. So this is going to be fun. Sarah, this isn't exactly breaking news, but I'm just going to say it. Comfy clothes are here to stay. Uh, yes. Okay. I am here for this. I mean, I was already on the cozy train even before COVID, but now I'm like, give me all the stretchy waistbands and soft fabrics, but they still need to be cute, right? Well, obviously. And you're in luck, Sarah, because our partner Fabletics has the most stylish activewear. Seriously, I love their pretty colors, fun prints, and fashionable details. And right now we can get our listeners a fab you list deal uh -huh, mm -hmm. of two bottoms for just $24 when they become VIP members. A VIP subscription is a great way to build that workout wardrobe or replace your worn out leggings with Fabletics best selling version. And you can always skip a month if it's not in your budget. Yeah, I love how flexible that is. And listeners, just click our special link from the show notes or head to themomhour.com slash fabletics to get that special deal. That's themomhour.com slash fabletics for fashionable activewear for everyone. Megan, we love hearing from our listeners who say they feel like they know us and we're their friends because the sentiment really does go both ways. And for our friends who want to share their love for the show, we have a shop. Yes, it's true. If you go to themomhour.com and click on shop in the top bar, you'll find shirts, mugs, and even the cutest little onesies for sale. And we know that some of you got or gave the Mom Hour merch at the holidays. So if you do own any of our gear, we would love to see a picture of you. Go ahead and post a picture on social media and tag us in it. We'd love it. Oh, yeah, that would be so fun to see. And I love thinking of us all over the country and the world drinking out of our Mom Hour mugs. So again, you can find that link right on the homepage of our website at themomhour.com or go directly to themomhour.com slash shop. All right. So we are going to dive into hating on some fun. One of our favorite things to do, Megan. And when we were preparing for this episode, we were chatting with some of our contributors too. It did occur to me that like, like you said, with the water park, there are things that change over time because kids get older. There are things that are very personality specific. Um, there are things that are fun, but we'd rather do them alone. So <laughs> let's just rattle off a few categories here. I love that one. Things that are things that are supposed to be fun with kids, but that we'd actually rather do by ourselves. And we're going to talk about several of those. Um, there are some things that are just never going to be fun for us. And I think that comes like to your point about personalities, like uh, parades are never going to be fun. It doesn't matter if my kids get older or my life circumstances right. change. Um, sometimes there are things and I've found this as my kids have gotten older that are sometimes fun amusement parks in the with the right set of circumstances on a day that's not hot when I can you know, avoid the crowds. Amusement parks are sometimes fun with my kids. They are not always fun. So that's very like conditional. Um, and then a big one that I think happens a lot is there's fun with kids that we get very excited to do. And I'm going to use gingerbread houses as an example, because we are recording <laughs> this. We're recording this during the holidays. Gingerbread houses seem like a very fun thing to do with kids. And often you will find it is not. And here's the thing. If you wait two years or five years it could become fun again. I think a lot of times some of the fun we try to have is actually premature. We get excited about it because we're moms and we saw pictures in a magazine. But if you but if we wait a few years, the actual fun kicks in when kids are older and more independent. And I can think of so many um, scenarios where it's like it will be fun, but it is not fun yet. And I think with the holidays, there is a lot, a lot of that not fun yet category. 
Well, and I think that too, that there is like so many of those things have a modification for younger mm-hmm. kids Yeah, that can be like age appropriately fun. Uh-huh. And if you want a great, like if you want to learn, look to what your kids' preschool teachers are doing with them in class. Mm. They're probably not making a full on gingerbread house. They're probably like sticking some graham crackers together mm-hmm. with frosting that mm-hmm. came out of a tube. Mm-hmm. It's like, what are the parts that are fun? Um, right. An amusement park, probably not going to be fun with a three-year-old, but maybe there's like a little tiny area of like a local zoo that has like a little ride that you get on or, or something like that. Like I, we have those around here where there's the one little place you can pop into that has like the one ride that's toddler appropriate. Right. And that's legitimately fun. And then you're not overwhelmed by standing around um, on hot pavement when your kids can't even go on three quarters of the rides. Like there's always like, there's almost always some little slice of the mm-hmm. not fun thing that you can take out and actually make it fun. And I actually think looking to the things that your kids are doing with the people who um, do have this as career. their job, yeah. have a career <laughs> in making not fun things fun. Like they know what they're doing. So pay mm-hmm. attention. And then I would add one more thing, one more category. And that is the things that are fun for other people to do with your kids. Yeah. Let yeah. them do it. Yes. Whether it's that preschool teacher who that's their job and that's what they love or a, or a, an aunt or a friend, family friend who loves to like bead mm-hmm. with small fingers that can't hold a bead, like whatever the thing yep. is, right? Someone out there probably loves to do the thing that you don't love to do. So there's that category of like, it'll never be fun for you, but let it be fun for someone else. A hundred percent. I love that. All right. Well, let's dive in. We've got a couple of big ones to start. Yeah. So the first one is cooking and baking. Like what a crock of goods we've been sold (laughs) that cooking with your kids is supposed to be fun. And I'm saying this fairly tongue in cheek because I understand the benefits of cooking with kids and I've done it. Like all of my kids have been in the kitchen with me from an early age, sometimes literally strapped to my body, sometimes perched on a um, counter. I actually remember writing a blog post way back in the day, like when Clara was a toddler. I remember this too. I remember reading And I had to defend sticking her on a counter while I cooked because it was the only way I could cook without Mm -hmm. having, you know, like a barnacle hanging off of my leg and whining, which is not, Mm -hmm. it's just not sustainable. So I would sit her up in the counter and hand her like a, I don't know, um, rolling pin or something, Mm -hmm. right? Or a bowl and a spoon or something. And I would always just make sure that my hand that she was scooched all the way back Mm -hmm. and that my hand was always close enough that I could block her from falling off the counter. That was Mm -hmm. like my rule. And then as long as those two things were in place, I just kind of went about my business and it was great. It actually allowed me to do a lot. That's not cooking with kids. That's not baking with kids. That's baking and cooking with kids adjacent. Mm -hmm. And I think this idea that cooking and baking with kids is going to be fun um, often reflects some really out, uh, outmoded expectations perhaps mm-hmm. on our yeah. And it, it also like, it assumes that every cooking and baking, uh, project has the same desired output or output or the same definition of success. And we have a post on the blog from Jamie that does such a good job of breaking this down, like deciding what is important about this particular baking right. day is it that the the toddler gets to stir and mix? Well, if that's the case, maybe the way the cookies taste is not going to be the most important thing. It's almost like we've assigned we've assigned like this definition of success to a baking with kids project too broadly, and in fact, it's impossible. It creates impossible uh, expectations. Well, Jamie's post was genius because she really breaks down like here's what's important to you. Here's what's important to them here's how you get both of those things. Right. And I mean, I remember when my kids were little, I would just give them random, um, ingredients to mix together in a bowl Mm -hmm. and stir on their own. And I didn't, that never made it in to the final product. And they had no idea. They thought they were baking with me because they were doing the things they were mirroring the things they saw me doing. Um, but that bowl of like flour, sugar, sprinkles, like whatever, that wasn't going to actually end up in my finished product. They just, they had no idea. So it's that going back and forth between actually, what am I trying to achieve here? It doesn't all have to be fun. And if the product is the goal, then the process is separate. Yes. And she kind of helps you decide like what is important 
And if that's important, then what else can you let go? That's really what it's yeah. all about. Um, I want to say what is fun for me now and when it comes to baking, and it is not baking with my kids, but my kids have been independent bakers from a very young age. And it started with Allegra because she was naturally interested in it. And I would say she has been baking independent, meaning I don't even need to like, I am not there for any part of it, probably since she was about eight and a half, nine, maybe. And then the youngers have, have followed suit and Violet can, Violet can follow a recipe and bake on her own. And she is also coming up on nine. Reed um, makes pancakes from scratch every weekend. So they're all really capable. And something that is fun for me is when my kids bake independently and I putter around the kitchen and I will even help clean because they are, it's, they, they're engaged in their own hands-on activity. They don't need my help. I don't have to be a control freak about like the, the way the cookies are spaced on the cookie sheet. Like I've completely removed my own issues and I admit they are my issues completely removed. And yet I get to enjoy that my kids enjoy baking. And that's very different than baking with my children. I'm not sure like when, when it happened or what I did before that, but it, it is a, it's glorious. Well, that it's one of those things that like, it just comes with age, right? Yeah. 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 Well, let's talk about crafting. You mentioned (laughs) it when you talked about the library. So here's uh, crafting is a big category. And, and I actually like you, I don't mind when kids do some open-ended crafting and I'm sort of like hovering around as an assistant. That's okay with me. The type of crafting that is supposed quote unquote fun that I cannot stand is like a parent and me project together because like the baking, it forces my own control freakness right up against my kids desire to be creative in their own way. And it's just, it's not a pretty sight. So I have a funny story about one of those pottery painting places um, (laughs) that actually I tried to do pottery painting places a lot when my kids were really small and it was probably always a disaster. But um, when Allegra was two and a half, not even three, my, uh, you know, unwitting fellow mom friends and I, we were so naive, um, signed up for this little like guided paint where there was a plate and it was going to become a plate of cookies for Santa. And you were going to use your child's thumbprints as the little reindeer. So there's many things that set this up for not success. One was that it had a very specific output. Like there was a way to do this right. And there was a step-by-step. And if you give me a way to do something right and a step-by-step process, I am not going to be very flexible (laughs) about like just doing something else. And I had a two and a half year old with me that was way too young to think that like she would enjoy like having her little thumb forced like, oh, not there. We're not going to put Rudolph there. there. (laughs) Nope, nope. Right here. Meanwhile, there was actually a lot of technically kind of difficult painting. Like you first you did the whole sky blue and there was she wasn't going to help with any of that. Here's the kicker, Megan. Picture this. I have a six month old facing outward in a Bjorn strapped to my chest (laughs) who is old enough to reach out for things like cups of water and paintbrushes as I am leaning over feet Mm -hmm. kicking. Yes. Yeah. Feet kicking, grabbing sister's (laughs) ponytail while I'm leaning over. And then times that by, there were three of us with the toddler and the little, it's just such a funny story of thinking it falls a little bit into the not yet for sure. Not yet. We were, our kids were way too young for something like that. But also I think the having, having this like plate held up as like, this is what we're making today. And you and your toddler are going to enjoy making this together. That was not a good fit for me and my personality. It was not fun for anyone. Um, and probably put pressure on the toddlers that like, they would have been happy finger painting a mug for grandma, which that, you know, that, that could be a modification at a pottery painting place, but, um, didn't go so well. (laughs) Yeah. Um, I am thankful that I never, I mean, it almost sounds like the kid version of like the wine and canvas thing, yes. which I with have toddlers. never done one of those with toddlers. I've never done one of those because for me, like, it just doesn't sound like fun to go have someone else tell me what I'm going to paint. I'm not a painter to begin with. So like even just starting that it, it's not fun. And, e- and even the way we've talked already about, um, like on the Instagram live, when I was talking about embroidery and how. I'll follow the instructions for about half of it. And then I'm like, nah, I'm just going to do it the way I want. And, and I'm just there. I want to do it. Right. Exactly. I just do it how I want, or I want to make my own um, designs and things like that. So like having someone else tell me like, you're going to paint exactly this on a canvas and what's going to make it fun is wine. <laughs> to me does not, <laughs> does not make it fun. Um, 
I will say that I don't mind offering my kids pre cut or pre like, I don't mind giving them some inspiration and some like pre curated supplies that they can then do whatever they want with right. on their time. Right. And I can just kind of be doing my thing, like puttering around. I don't even mind cleaning up the mess after I'm not a fan of glitter, but, but like, I don't mind cleaning up that mess. I just don't want that expectation that for probably different reasons from you, but, but still yeah. that expectation that this is what we are creating today. Well, here's my other problem. I have a, a, a list of things that are also not fun, even about that. And maybe your kids' personalities didn't play out this way. But even when I would attempt that kind of maybe at home crafting that was a little more open ended, or maybe we got a cute kit from Michael's or Target, I have at least two of my three children, exactly two of my three children, have that perfectionistic streak where they are now mad at me that the googly <laughs> eyes like are crooked. And I'm like, well, this is a fine kettle of fish. Like, I didn't even <laughs> want to do this to begin with. And like, how am I and supposed to fix? And that was my fault. Like, right. And it is yeah. for sure my fault you're a perfectionist, but that's for a different conversation. So like kids getting mad about that the art project isn't going their way is like a double, it's a double trigger for me because it wasn't fun to begin with. And now they're somehow like not even happy with just the ability to like play with art supplies. Um, so yeah, not, well, not a fan. That, that's not a great combo, but tis the season to talk about cookie decorating. And <laughs> it also, it also kind of bridges these two yes, categories that we've talked about crafting sure and does. baking. Right. So were your kids the type that you could hand like a knife and some frosting that you already colored or that you bought colored and some say sprinkles and like, I don't know, those little, um, metal, like those little, balls, not metal, yeah. but little balls and say, Hey, <laughs> go at it. And they'd be happy. Or were they mad at you about that? No, they would be happy with that. And that okay. is the type of thing where it, uh, as, as I've learned how to have my own fun, we would just do that kind of cookie decorating on one session. And then if I wanted to enjoy making pretty cookies or trying something more artistic, I would do that at a different time just on my own or maybe with my oldest child. It's trying to do it all at once. But yeah, they didn't get to they didn't get as um as like hung up with cookie decorating, probably just because they were excited to eat it anyway. So that well, one has right. been OK for us. And and also maybe they weren't looking at a template that was telling well, them it to look say. like this. Yeah. If we had gotten one of those like kits with examples of like exactly here's how to make it, I could see the exact same thing happening as does with crafts. But we usually just make sugar cookies and icing and just go, go to town. That's what we've always done too. And, and for a long time, honestly, I would just buy the roll of right. sugar cookie dough and slice it up. And the kids got to make round things every year. It was round. You can, you can do whatever you want creatively, but your canvas is cookie. round. Well, that was That's another tip is. from Jamie was that if the goal, if this particular baking adventures, quote unquote, fun is in the decorating don't spend your time on a homemade recipe. Don't right. like if the fun that is built into today's activity has to do with decorating, then who cares about the baking or the, you know, that's not the fun. So almost right. like zero in on what is, what is the most fun we can have with this today? And then for sure, don't stress about the rest. Yeah. Well, all right. Well, the next category, <laughs> this was me that brought this up and maybe this will make some people laugh and roll their eyes, but I just have to say, Yoga is something that I have loved for decades now. And I have a very specific memory of when, um, and I think you could apply this to a lot of different kind of, I don't know, not fitness. Cause that's not why I did yoga, but like a more mindfulness type mm -hmm. of thing, like a mommy and me meditation, whatever. Mm -hmm. I remember going to mommy and me yoga when I had, and I think it was Owen might've been Will. Maybe I did it with both Will and Owen because that would have been around the time that I was very kind of involved in the, like the yoga e mm -hmm. uh, natural uh, mom community in my town. And I just remember going to this yoga class and thinking, this is just miserable. This is not yoga. This is what I remember thinking. Like, I can't even go five minutes without having to go, like, leave my mat and go sit against the wall and nurse or change a blowout diaper or walk around the room with a fussy baby. That all the things that I loved about yoga mm -hmm. became kind of stripped away. And it was just parenting in a room with a bunch of other people <laughs> with like a good smelling aromatherapy 
thing going on and music and then other people doing very like stripped down versions of yoga poses. And I was like, man, I could do all this at home for free. Like, why am I here? And I think that, I think that for me, it was that what I needed from yoga, it was not social time for me. What I wanted and needed to get out of yoga was not being served by trying to do yoga in a room with 20 moms and babies. Now there was something really beautiful about it. There was something really beautiful about the idea that we're all there. We all have little, little babies and like, it's totally okay for any one of us to scoop up our baby and go nurse him or her at any Mm -hmm. time or whatever. Like there was something really nice about that, but I wasn't there to be in community. I was there to do yoga and I didn't have childcare. And I thought that was the way that I could have that. And it wasn't that. It and weren't. it was very frustrating to me. And I think there's probably like that example of like the thing you really want for yourself. Mm-hmm. So you try to get it by doing like the mom and me version of it. And right. you don't, it's like not good for anybody. Right. <laughs> that I think is such a common theme um, of things that are supposed to be fun and aren't. Yeah. I think that's a really good point. And I think there's like such a broader lesson there into paying attention to the things you miss about of doing yourself of doing by yourself, because it is a common mistake to try, like you said, to loop small children into a thing to serve a need that you have. When we talked about our guesting and hosting um, like holiday parties, we talked about like moms do need to go to a party. We do need a night out, but doing that with our children in tow is a completely different experience. So yeah. Yeah. I would say that mommy and me, anything has the potential (laughs) to be not, fun. And it is one that I think it, um, it strikes a chord with people because people then get very not defensive, but they, but mommy and me classes or experiences can also be profoundly helpful in creating community, meeting new friends, having a place to go with your baby. So they absolutely serve a purpose, but they can also feel like torture and they can also not be at all fun. And I think it's a real trial and error in early motherhood to find the one that doesn't feel awful to you. So I'm I'm just saying that out loud in case on the one hand, we have people listening who are like, oh my gosh, I thought I was the only one who hated mommy and me music class. Like I hate it. And then on the other hand, on the other extreme, you have people who are like, are you kidding? Like, that's the thing I look forward to every week. That's where I met my only friend in the world. And it's like the only day I feel like I can dress my baby in a cute outfit and go talk to other adults. So I see both extremes and everything in the middle. But I I also want to say that a lot of mommy and me experiences are quite expensive and not fun. And I think, yeah. I think that for me, the ones that have actually been the most fun, a either the group I wound up with was awesome. And mm-hmm. you can't plan for that. Like right. you, you, there's no way to know when you're going to go into a group that just gels and create, and like you said, creates that environment where you can meet that bestie or that little group of moms that now become your people. Um, and the one where I have no expectations mm-hmm. of wanting to do that thing for the sake of that thing, right. like where the thing itself is totally separate. So for me, like mommy and me music also made me crazy. Cause I really like music mm-hmm. and that was not music. That was like, you know, <laughs> banging things. And like the one that I went to again, very, like, I'm sure they all vary, but the one I went to was just baby cacophony, which is fine. If that's what I'm expecting, Mm -hmm. or if the baby noises are happening and the adults are talking over their heads to each other, that's great. But if the expectation is that we're all going to like make something like music with our babies. And to me, it doesn't sound like music and I'm really into music. That's a recipe for frustration. So it's like, yeah, going in like the group, your expectations, um, what you need and maybe mm-hmm. thought you were going to get out of the thing that maybe that needs not being met. All of those things play in. Yeah. Agreed. Megan, today we're talking about our partner minted, which is one of my favorite places to shop for gifts. I feel like people think of holiday cards and maybe framed photos when they think of minted, but it's actually a marketplace for independent artists who create all kinds of things, home decor, table linens, journals, and stationery, and original art. Well, I'm glad you reminded me of this, Sarah, because I think I'm guilty of forgetting to check back in with Minted to see what kind of new, unique home accents and gifts they might have. They have accent furniture, tabletop decor, and all kinds of art. When you shop their site, you get to learn all about the original artists and their backgrounds and stories, almost like shopping an incredibly well-curated craft fair, but online. 
And listeners, when you use our special link, you can help support the Mom Hour and an independent artist and a really incredible company all at the same time. Visit themomhour.com slash minted, a special page on our site where we've both picked some minted products we're eyeing right now, plus some great deals for you. Again, that's themomhour.com slash minted. Sarah, we have been having so much fun lately in our Instagram subscriber community. You may have seen these popping up in your IG feed lately and wonder what it's all about. Well, basically, it's just another way to connect with us. Subscribing is a great option for listeners who are avid Instagram users or maybe who just like consuming bonus content. We've been doing a special monthly bonus episode on IG Live, which is so fun because Instagram is so visual, so we can actually show off some of the things we're talking about. Yeah, Megan. And one of the most fun things is we can actually open up a little group chat right after the live episode so subscribers can talk to each other and we can interact too. We've got people sharing their own photos and asking each other questions, which is really fun. If you want to join us in our Instagram subscriber community, it's really easy. Just head to the Mom Hours profile on Instagram. We're at the Mom Hour and you'll see a subscribe button right there. Hopefully we'll see you over there soon. All right, Megan. So here we go with some more things that are supposed to be fun, but very much aren't, at least to us. And these next ones, I think, are geared a little bit more toward older kids, which is funny because we we keep saying that some of these things get a little easier and potentially more fun when you're out of, mm, I'm going to say like the preschool kinder, like when you're ages six and seven and up, a lot of these things naturally get more fun. But I have a couple of things that are still not fun. And I have older kids. And the one that I thought of is listening to music with my children is not fun. And I keep thinking it might be fun and it isn't. Um, and I have a couple of examples when they were littler, they'd listen with me to music that I liked. And sometimes they'd ask questions like, Ooh, what does that song mean? Or what are they singing about? Or can we, and it, I thought it was really cute because they would start to like maybe music that I liked. And for a hot second, it felt fun. And then one of two things would happen. They'd either want it on repeat and pretty soon I would start to hate music that I used to love um, because it's just it's just they want over and over and over and over again. Or I just stopped associating it with like something that was my own and it just became somehow integrated into like kid time and it didn't it it lost its luster. So um, I have not super enjoyed listening to music with my kids, including like all the way up through this year. It's not that I don't like the music they like or that they don't like the music I like. It's that somehow the act of doing it together makes me hate everything. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, so I love that you're sharing that. It's very opposite from what my mostly experience has been with my kids. Because for the most part, listening to music together is a super fun part of our life. Like, especially because a couple of my kids are really good um, DJs, like road trip DJs. Mm, Okay. Um, and we have a couple musicals that we all love to listen together and just like sing at the top of our lungs. And that's really, really fun. Here's two places where it gets super annoying when you have teenagers. One is that they now have their own really strong opinions. And you know, this Mm -hmm. because of Allegra, Mm -hmm. um, about like what they love and some of it you might find annoying, or maybe you just don't want to listen to it on repeat forever, but you feel like you, but you do kind of feel like you need to nurture that. And so what I've doing especially on road trips this is where this plays out my kids will troll me in the kitchen a little bit and come in and like mess with my google home and make her stop playing what i want to hear and play something different but it that's my realm and i can kick them out at any time and they know that i will if they push it too hard in the car it's harder because i can't actually open up the car door and throw the kids out on the highway (laughs) and usually i'm busy driving so like someone else is in control literally of the music and I will literally just look out the window and put a smile on my face, like a little, the smile that says I'm mildly amused with you right now, but you're really close to the edge of making me very mad. So just, I plant that little smile on my face and then I completely zone out. Like Uh I just totally, I'm not even in the car anymore until they're done listening to juice world or whatever it is that they're listening to. And then we can get back to this because there's plenty of music we all love together. Um, another example, I was on my way back last week from the water park that actually was fun, but Clara was with me and the boys had all gone in it one car together. So, um, that's a new thing that will happen when you have driver Mm -hmm. kids. Like sometimes you split the group up and all the way home, Clara wanted to listen to dear Evan Hansen. Now that's been one of our family things. We listen to dear Evan Hansen on road trips. Um, typically it's will in the front seat. 
he and I like play off of each other. Like he does all the guy parts. Mm -hmm. I do all the girl parts. It's great. Um, and I really wanted to want to listen to it, but the traffic was really bad. And it was the kind of, I had been in a water park now for like 24 yes. hours oh and they're my very gosh. loud. Yes. And I just kept saying, Clara, honey, I'm so sorry. I just want to zone out. I just don't want to listen to that right now. Mm -hmm. And so I got my silence and like about 45 minutes from home, I stopped at a rest, a rest area, which is the bathroom, got myself together. I got in the car and I'm like, okay, now. So we listened to Dear Evan Hansen for like the last 45 minutes, but I just couldn't like it mm -hmm. sounded, I couldn't fake it. Like she would expect me to sing along. I knew I didn't want to. I just, I couldn't pull that off. So anyway, I hear you. Mm -hmm. And we've also both talked to Sarah about how awkward we feel about listening to like podcasts in front of our kids. Yes. I think we've talked about it on, on the show. Yeah, we have. We're like actually podcasts and music to a certain extent feels like a very kind of private, intimate thing. And I think that is very true for me. So it's like having these three intruders in my in in my music listening experience or being dragged into theirs against my will. But I'm not going to say we've never had things that we truly can enjoy together. Hamilton had a good run for like, gosh, two or three years um, before they kind of outgrew it. And I we all got sick of it. So it's we've had our moments, but um, maybe maybe that's still ahead. Those road trips, they, they don't even agree on their own. Like they they each don't even like their own their separate music. So it just feels like there's a lot that, of that internal age that you're at. Yeah, yeah, that's hard. That's hard. What you really have to do is get Reed to the age where he likes Allegra's music and <laughs> then Violet, just due to sheer FOMO, yeah. will go along. Yeah. But yeah. you have to have like, you have to have the, um, the two majority. out of three rule. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yep. Okay. So um, this next one came from our team member, Katie. I love this because I don't know that this is something I've actually done on purpose in my family but probably by accident. So she says, not fun yet. Any kind of family competition <laughs> as well. Call it one kid cheers while another wails. And I'm thinking back to like the kinds of competitions that my kids would do on their own. Like who's the fastest to get to the mailbox or right. whatever, you know? And usually, yes, that's exactly how it wound up. One would fall on their face and cry. And the other one would get there and I would just be irritated. But I mm -hmm. do know that sometimes like competitions are built into family culture. And I guess sometimes it's fun, question mark. I mean, yeah, I related to this a lot because my youngest child is my most competitive. And that is not a great mix because when you're the littlest, you just aren't going to win a lot of those spontaneous competitions. And and like you said, ours have been more like, I'll race you to the end of the hallway type thing. But I can think of times where we have thought it would be fun to have a guessing game competition or like see who can get closest. It's not fun. I agree with Katie. It, it um, can breed unhealthy competition feelings for quite a while, probably until, I don't know, everyone's a little too old to care who wins. And that takes right. a long time. I have to tell you, my kids have a very funny competition that they have just invented on their own. And that's my favorite kind of family culture things is the really random things that, that just they didn't they spontaneously generate. And this one is called long fry contest. And it is when everyone is eating, <laughs> everyone's eating French fries, like you're out at fast food or you got takeout or whatever. And someone holds up a fry, a French fry that just is like absurdly long. Like the ones where you're like, Ooh, how did this like make it through the quality control? Like it's extra long. And that person will be like long fry contest. And when they yell that everybody at the table looks for the longest French fry on their plate and holds it up. And maybe, maybe the original person isn't actually the winner but they're the one who prompts the competition at any point in the meal. Long fry contest. They'll also do it with like any other, like some, like sometimes it's a noodle or like, they'll be like, you know, short noodle contest. And then you hunt around and you find, you find your entry. Okay. I love this. Do you find <laughs> that the kids specifically don't like, like hoard their longer or shorter noodles or fries because they think at some point they might be called upon? I don't think they do because it's usually such like it's so spontaneous and we're usually mid conversation about it, it just could pop up anytime and it can okay. it pops up when anybody discovers that they have an unusually long French fry and then it immediately <laughs> everything stops long fry contest. So I have to just chime in really quick because this is bringing back not your story necessarily, but just thinking about family competitions in general is bringing back a memory that I have as a youngest. So here's where Violet and Clara mm -hmm. and I are like all yeah. on the same page. One of the like most frustrating moments is when you're old, finally old enough to actually win 
some competitions. Yeah, nobody cares. Or like the older siblings will almost kind of cruelly rob you of the opportunity to win by being like, whatever. You know right. what I mean? Like yes. maybe they do care, but they're just going to pretend that they don't. That is and true. I remember that being really hard as like yeah. a probably like nine to 12 year old. Being yes. like, man, I could actually run pretty fast now. Or maybe I could win an arm wrestling contest. Or maybe I'm smart enough now to be the one who I don't remember what games yeah. we were yeah. playing. But like suddenly everyone else is like, meh, over they it. They don't care. So oh there gosh. were all those years where I was the loser. And then I'm finally equipped. And there's the no winner. competitors. And there's no, there's no one to compete with. Yeah, that was hard. That was hard. I can see that. I can yeah. see that. Okay, well, I have another one that is currently not fun in my family and that I tried to do recently and it was not fun. And that is leisure shopping. And by leisure shopping, I mean kind of window shopping or popping in and out of cute shops. And with the pandemic, of course, we didn't do that for a long time. Um, and Violet loves, she actually does love to shop. She loves things. She loves um, new things. She's like a shiny object, you know, yeah. person. And I made the mistake of thinking, well, I forget why we were downtown. I said, let's, we have an hour to kill. Let's just walk around a little bit. And she said, mommy, I don't have any money. And she doesn't get an allowance yet. And the older ones do. And she really didn't have any birthday money or any kind of money. And I said, well, that's okay. We're just going to pop in and look. And she said, mommy, I don't like to shop. I don't, if like I to don't look. have money <laughs> yes. to buy. And she, to her credit, she looked me right in the eyes and said, I don't want to do this. And I was like, yeah, but you know, we hadn't been downtown Santa Barbara in a while because of the pandemic. I said, every, let's just, let's just walk around a little bit and we'll, maybe we'll pop into a store. And <laughs> she tried to warn me. She had a meltdown, um, tantamount to those of younger years about like a $4 goat in a stationary shop <laughs> that I, I was like, I was, I, I couldn't believe this was my life. Cause I, you know, she's eight, this is like six months ago. So she's eight years old and we're well past, um, those types of meltdowns, but she really, I should have given her more credit for knowing herself. It was not going to be fun for her to window shop or leisure shop. If she couldn't buy anything, she, it, and she knew that about herself and tried to tell me. And the older kids, same thing. If we try to leisure shop, it's all about how much money do I have? Mom, have I gotten my allowance? Can you check my bank balance? How much money do I have? Okay, I don't want to go here. Uh, okay, I have $20. What can I get for $20? It becomes very much about the getting. And so they just are not at the stage where they can have fun. I don't know what else you call that. Just window shopping. or Window like, shopping. Yeah. So leisure shopping in my mind is is like open to purchasing. Like sure. you're, you're not necessarily, that's not necessarily your goal, but you might, but window shopping truly is you're just looking. Right. But even when my kids have a little money to spend, I also find it's not super fun because the spending of the money becomes the whole focus. And so yes, you and still lose the leisure. And, yeah. Yes. The leisure falls away and you're just left with like, I got to get this $18 out of my wallet and I'm going to find the near. Uh, yeah. Well, the problem with kids in that age range is that they don't have the, they don't control their own shopping destinies, right? Like they're right. not going to go to the store on their own. So they're in a store. Mom brought yeah. me here. I'm just thinking of Clara when we went to the Mothman uh, yes. Museum and gift yeah. shop last year. It was like watching someone have a complete and utter meltdown. I've never really witnessed quite this level of shopping anxiety because here she is. She loves Mothman, apparently. She wants to buy this hoodie. So she's holding it, but going, it looks really badly made. And it's really expensive. And I think this whole place is just a ripoff. And it's just like, it, uh, it's just like a tourist trap. But yet, I don't want to leave without it. And but she I, couldn't, I must have it. Yeah, she couldn't. She could not deal. And so she finally bought it and then kicked herself. Like, she beat herself up all the rest of the trip about it. And I was like, well, I mean, that's just a lesson she has to learn, I guess. But... Yeah. But well, but. And it, going back to something that we keep uh, the refrain of this episode is I find leisure shopping and window shopping very enjoyable. So I should find opportunities for me to do that by myself and not yes. think not think it will be fun with the kids. And this is I've made this mistake. It's like this is like a hard one for me to learn. And going back before we lived in Santa Barbara, when we'd come here to visit my parents, um, it has such a charming downtown with so many like boutique shops that I would often say, oh, let's go downtown as a family. We'll get a coffee. We'll just walk around. That's not what I wanted was for me to go downtown with a coffee and pop in and out of shops. And it was it's been very hard for me to learn that that is not fun with my children. Yeah. 
Well, this next one is near and dear to my heart. <laughs> Catherine from our contributor team said um, that in her life, bike rides are not fun. She says someone always gets hurt. No one is ever the same speed or ability. It takes forever to get everything and everyone ready. And then they only want to ride for five minutes. I also live on a hill. So both up and down are stressful. Zero out of 10 enjoyment for everyone. And Catherine, I feel you. I had these huge high hopes of being a biking family when I had five young kids to the extent that I bought a tandem thing that fit on the back of like, I think I got it on Craigslist or I don't know or something. This was before Facebook marketplace, but you would like attach it to your bike. And that Uh was going to be for like the next kid down. I had a baby seat for the front of my bike. I had Mm -hmm. a trailer that fit to like between all of the accoutrement I had. um, We should have all been able to go out on bike rides. Here's the thing. (laughs) <laughs> wending your way through a town with five children. It's just not fun. In my not opinion, fun. like it's just not fun. It's terrifying. You have to ride on the road. There's really, you can't do it on the sidewalk and you shouldn't anyway, but you can't trust your slightly older kids, like your 10 year old to stay in the appropriate area. And you really right. can't trust uh, drivers to know what's going on, especially in a small town where like, it's not that common to see huge family groups out in the street riding. And there's no way, like if you're on a bicycle with a baby attached to the bicycle, there's no way to quickly save your six year old who might wander (gasps) out into like, you can't like there's, you're you're literally sacrificing one of your babies to the others. Yes. It's terrible. And I tried it a few times and it was so awful. So finally, what I started doing was going out one-on-one with certain kids. Like I would go ride with a bigger kid who really wanted to, or just Mm -hmm. with the baby. And that was pretty fun, but it was never really fun. And this (laughs) was just never really, really fun. And that's one of those things where I just didn't ride my bike a whole lot until like last year, because I was like, okay, well now I can do it. And now any one of my kids is big enough to jump on a bike and go do it with me. And so this is one of those probably not fun when your kids are little, unless you have like one yeah. who you can attach to maybe two that you can attach to your person or they're older and you can trust them a little bit. Right. It's when you have this whole mess of kids. And I, I use big into reading um, blogs written by people who <laughs> only bicycled like in the city with their kids. They didn't even have cars. And I would just think, Oh my gosh. Okay. So, um, this is really going to like work great because this woman who lives in New York city does it with her right. four and six year old. She doesn't even own a car for goodness sakes. Very different. Yeah. Everything about her life was different from my life. And I needed to remember that. And yeah. I didn't always like, I didn't always make that connection. Um, I have not even ever attempted being a biking family, but I'm going to, I'm going to end my part by talking about two outdoor things that could or should be fun. One of which has not been, and one of which was so hiking is something with the kit, with all the kids has been something I have wanted to make fun and not been super successful with. Now, I, I believe a lot of that is my own. I haven't tried. I haven't looked for the opportunities to make an all family hike very fun. And we haven't done it enough because I think there are ways to make hiking with even really little kids, um, like a fun part of family culture. But for us, it has usually been much like Catherine described, which is someone is always someone's behind or can't keep up. Someone gets hurt. It's hot. All of the things. Um, but I we just this past week, I went kayaking as a family and it struck me how that the kayaking solved so many of the challenges of both biking and hiking, because first of all, we're contained. They were tandem. I was gonna say everyone's contained in their own yes. unit. Yes. Or their own double unit. And right? even fast grownups or teenagers aren't particular. It's hard to be very, very fast at kayaking. Like, I mean, unless you just do it all the time, we're all a little awkward. We have to rely on each other because we did tandem pairs and we paired up the logical pairings. So Reed and I were a pair because we're kind of like in the middle. But Brian was with Violet because he's big and strong. And Allegra was with my mother in law, who's capable, but, you know, she hadn't done a lot of kayaking and Allegra actually was more experienced. So It was actually very, very fun. And I'm thinking about even though kayaking seems like maybe a little more adventurous or more out there of an idea than a hike or a bike ride, it actually was a way better choice for our family because of everything Catherine described. It, it, it didn't accentuate the differences in athletic ability. Um, it allowed us to like control our own destiny a little bit. And it was novel enough that like everybody was kind of new to it. And that was like a, it leveled the playing field. It was very fun. 
Yeah, those um, tandem kayaks. I've actually had a lot of success kayaking with my kids separately. Maybe not. I don't, I can't remember if we've all ever gone out together, but I've gone out at least with pairs of kids in the past. And those kayaks, like the rental kayaks, like the doubles, yeah. um, they are like the great, they are the great equalizer because they slow you down. Like yeah. if, if anybody was in their own like sea kayak and they were just like, woo, I'm going for it. That's a little bit different. Maybe if they were strong enough and experienced, they could be really fast, but that's not right. how it is. When there's two people in a boat, no matter who those two people are, they're figuring it out together. And I've done lots of um, group kayaking tours mm -hmm. where you'll have people who are very experienced and then you'll have a family who's literally never been in one before and everyone's kind of the same. Like there's yeah. not, it just, it does equal things out a lot. So I am a big fan. I love that. Yeah. And, and with hiking, I think it just depends on your expectations. Like, yeah, <laughs> like let's, you know, the word hiking <laughs> creates this expectation of like scaling a mountainside or something. And really it's just walking outside for a while. Yes. You know? Yeah. It's just walking. A walk in nature. Yeah, right, exactly. Yeah. And with yeah. little kids, that means stopping every three feet. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, well, I guess as we kind of think about how to wrap this up and maybe words for moms who want to have fun doing things with their kids and are struggling, I think we've kind of touched throughout this episode on a, like a few different ways. One is to be patient and wait because things do get easier as time goes on. And I think that is advice I could have probably used in the early days is like, you're not doing anything wrong. This is someday going to feel more fun. It feels hard now because you have your hands full and you haven't slept all night. And I think going into this holiday season, if all you took away was that reminder that like, you're not doing anything wrong. If it doesn't feel fun, it, it's not you. It's not fun right now. And that could be because your kids aren't old enough or that is this is just not your jam, but it's not you. It's the thing. Um, so that's something I would like people to take away. And then I think something you brought up a couple of times, Megan, is that within a thing that doesn't feel fun, might there be a modification or like um, a peeling back of the layers? And that's what Jamie kind of touched on in the blog post, too, of like there is fun somewhere in this expectations laden thing. And a lot of times it's about scaling back or looking for what what the fun thing is and letting the rest go. So I think those are those are a couple of things I think maybe hopefully people will take away. Yeah. And I would also suggest that if, you know, you're going into um, the new year. So the holidays are loaded, right? Like, because this, this is all about moms making magic for kids. And there's no way to take that away. Like, there's really no way to separate th those two things out right mm -hmm. now. But going into, say, 2022, the other thing is to think about, is this not fun because you need something out of it that yes. has nothing to do with your yes, kids? Yes, 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 yes. And so if what you really, really want is to go to yoga, Mm -hmm. Or what you really, really want is to learn how to play an instrument or pick mm -hmm. back up an instrument you haven't. Or if what you really, really, really want is to make an amazing um, baked good, like a beautiful, mm -hmm. I don't know, uh, pastry of some sort, then you can invest time in yourself doing those things that does not have to be kid centric. And I actually think you'll have more fun if you do stuff with your kids where you don't care about the outcome. Yes. Like, where that is not the point. And that's the beauty of being a mom. Like you're the decider. Yeah. You get to decide which things you can't do at all. So decide the things you're going to do and don't assume that the things you love are going to be fun to include your two-year-old in. Right. Do the things you love because you love them in a way you love and include your two-year-old in something where you're the two-year-old. <laughs> right. Like, where you're both just like equally, I don't know, kind of dumb about it. I think yes. that's like a fun way to do things too. It's like no expectations, no skill. Yes. Just whatever. Yep. 100%. Well, as we wrap up today, just a reminder to go check out our sponsor, Matter of Fact. I have been loving their vitamin C serum and their minimalist hydrating cream. Yes, definitely go check them out, especially if you are in the market for some new grown up lady skincare, as we like to say. I am wearing that hydrating cream moisturizer right now. Just go to matteroffact.com to learn more and use the code MOM15 at checkout for 15% off your first purchase. Again, that's matteroffact.com and that code is MOM15 for 15% off your first purchase. Well, we will be back in your ears this coming Sunday for another More Than Mom episode. So that's two Sundays in a row this month that you get to hang out with us. Um, but then we're going to be taking the rest of December off of those More Than Moms. So definitely soak them up while you can. 
Yeah, I can't believe the year is coming to a close, but we don't take breaks, as you all know. So your Tuesdays continue right on through the end of the year. And we look forward to talking to everybody coming up this Sunday. Talk to you then. 